Hello and welcome to the sixth episode of our Understanding Class by Eric Olin Wright Reading Group series. Today is Tuesday the 7th of September 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we jump headlong into Chapter 2, The Shadow of Exploitation in Weber's Class Analysis. This week I have the new patrons James McGovern, Jens B, Emma Durr, Georgia Madsen and Smacky Jack to thank. If you like listening to extra patron-only episodes, creating Discord over on the Discord server, or joining in a future reading group series, why not head on over to the Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. Okay, onwards to the discussion. The link to the slides are included in the show notes. We did chapter one, so we're going to split chapter two. We're going to split it in two because it's a very long chapter. In the last section, he did kind of an overview of three kind of major areas. One was the kind of gradated kind of idea of class. Second was the opportunity hoarding view of Weber. And third was Marx's kind of exploitation slash domination. And now he's going to do a, a kind of a deep dive into Weber and look at how exploitation is in there in the weeds in Weber, even if it's not very prominent. Okay. Let's have a look at these chapter objectives. This is lovely. This is like one of these really boring presentations I used to have to do in work. Okay, so Love it. What's, our, what's our objectives? We're going to in, understand the inner structure of Weber's concept of class. And um, <laughs> I'm not sure who that was supposed what? to be. What, the what was that? that? I'm not sure. And then also we have, we're going to look at the similarities and differences between this and Marx's concept of class. So we're going to kind of dig into the real difference there. We're going to understand the, uh, or sorry, we're going to use this interrogation of Weber's work to defend the importance of the concept of exploitation for sociological theory. So he's kind of going to to use Weber to defend exploitation. Okay. They feel oriented. Okay, good. So the central concept of class is the problem of life chances in Weber. This idea of where you're born, you know, and the chances in life. Is, it, is he meaning more than just where you're born? Because that seems more like the gradated interpretation. Uh, no, I'd say this kind of plugs into an existentialist or kind of like Rawlsian liberal kind of like, you don't really know where you're going to end up and the conditions that you're like put into greatly affects your life chances. This is probably like most radically expressed as like biopolitics. Who dies because of their, the, the outcomes that their location in the structure of domination puts upon them essentially. Like, is that biopolitics or is that necropolitics? Cause who lives in biopolitics like, just about like the management of the population as a resource like you want to nurture and like manipulate the population in order to increase the power of the of the civilization or of the society technically you're right this is necropolitics but also you can't do biopolitics without necropolitics it's like a <laughs> oh yeah it's a weeding, yeah, it's a yeah, weeding yeah. mechanism yeah. of what you're encouraging versus it's like positive versus negative eugenics, essentially. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. But so, yeah. so fair um, point. Also, I, I barely care about this in as much as it, it forms maybe one of the more radical, like Weberian points of view, you know, necropolitics. I would say that it's Weberian, pretty much. What? Have I made a mess of this already? I don't know that like you've Foucault. made a mess of it. I actually, yeah. I mean, for more Bardouin and. and like, I th- one of the things is I think like the, the 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 three schemas. If we attach them to specific people, and then read those specific people into modern theory, it's misleading because you're like you're like five chains removed when you're saying like like Foucault is Weberian. He, Foucault right. might be, but he doesn't fucking know that. Like, yeah, but you know, I guess if we're talking about the mechanisms in a work, we're less concerned with how thinkers conceive themselves and more concerned with like how they explain things. So yeah, I would, I mean, accept that criticism basically. 
I just don't get the impression that biopolitics was like really what Weber was that interested in in formulating this theory. Like it's more about like just kind of understanding, well, how does this group of people operate in the world? What kind of mentality do they develop? And like, what are the sort of reciprocal relations between different groups that reproduce this way of life? You're right about that. I'm bringing this up as the most radical expression of uh, life chances, essentially. And the one that growing up, uh, like just sort of hit me the hardest. Why do some people die for what seems like an existential dice roll? Why didn't they get a chance? Right. It's it's yeah. not, this is not a, an a equality of opportunity problematic. This is something more than that. Yeah. Let us move on. Yeah, I'm just going to say that, like, you know, we should probably change this podcast, this, this series into, like, the Positive Eugenics podcast. What, is that what we're saying? Is that what I'm saying? Is, is that what I'm saying, <laughs> Is this thing on? Hello? <laughs> what okay. would Weber say about if the Irish are funny? Um, <laughs> we know what, what was it? What did Freud say about the Irish? He said, like, they were the only race that was impervious to psychoanalysis. I'm, I'm down with that. <laughs> That's their d d racial modifier. Uh, yeah. In, uh, immunity to psychoanalytic <laughs> abilities. <laughs> yeah. That and displacement. That's, now, that's, that's, uh, a, that's a dominant gene that's spread, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, we got the important property relations for Weber. We got the intimate connection between the nature of property relations in capitalism and the problem employers face in eliciting high output from workers. This is probably getting to you know this idea of rationality. It's not theorized in terms of a general concept of exploitation, and it doesn't see the extraction of labor effort as a pivotal feature of class relations and as a central determinant of class conflict. OK, and he treats the problem of labor performance as instances of technical inefficiencies between formal rationality and substantive rationality within capitalist relations. OK, like there's a lot in there, but let, let's have a look at this. What does he mean here by sub substantive rationality versus formal rationality? So this is the difference between instrumental and abstract reason. And... I think for people to understand like some of what's going on here in Weberianism and maybe even like how it's come up in Marxism before, you may remember like this whole stuff about like substantive rationality and formal rationality and instrumentalized reason had all come up in Adorno and Horkheimer's Dialectic of Enlightenment because they kind of take these categories like what we see in Weber and re and read them back on to Marx roughly although while kind of critiquing Marx while also kind of still claiming to be Marxist the the technical inefficiencies part is is something to grasp a little bit where you know opportunity cost and technical inefficiencies arise because of class motivation where like you get the idea that Weber thought that if you got these class tensions out of the way, capitalism might be more efficient and more productive. I mean, even though he was a socialist, like, so it's because the instrumentalized and formalized reason gets more and more broken apart. And yeah, Ezra, you want to step in here? Because I feel like I know what I'm talking about, but I'm actually having trouble yeah. articulating it. <laughs> this is part of why I brought up Foucault in the previous slide, but I think it is more useful to talk about the Frankfurt School. I think they're echoing Weber's fear about modernity and that the, the iron cage of rationality where the rationality of means, and this is a kind of a simple way to put it, but the rationality of means consumes the rationality of ends. Weber has a typology of different types of reason, you know, different ways that, you know, humans reason like, I mean, moral reason, for instance, people, you know, do you have to like process things to, see if they're right or not. But in a modern society, those other types of reason tend to get subsumed to instrumental reason. I remember hearing this as a theory, and then I was listening to 
you know, what at the time was one of the more interesting, like sort of skeptic podcasts called Rationally Speaking. And they were speaking very like, they were speaking very plainly, like reason is this one thing, it's instrumental rationality, and that reason guts everything. And that other kinds of reason, they didn't call reason. <laughs> and it really, I don't know, the example- well, it, le it that, led to Massimo Pe uh, Pagliucci, that one of the guys on that podcast at the time, I guess when you were listening to it, was, it, was Massimo still on there? Um, yes, yeah. Massimo began to distance himself from both the skeptics movement and reason qua reason and got really into and still is into like weird yeah. stoic reasoning as a answer to the problems that he saw emerging from this instrumentalized rationality. Whereas Julia Galef, who stayed, mm -hmm. still does the show, I think that show is still, mm -hmm. I think it still exists. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I just looked at it. I just looked at it recently. Is Julie Gala still on there? I was actually Facebook friends with yeah. her way back in the day. But like, yeah, um, really that. Julia also began first with this idea of reason qua reason, which dominated it at first. And later on began looking at different kinds of modal reasoning, you know, as an analogy to modal logic. But what's funny mm -hmm. is because they're so far down the analytic pipeline, they didn't know this work had already been done in sociology and that, that it had emerged in the 18th and 19th century already as a problem. Like it had already been something that people were aware of and analytics are kind of actually reinventing the wheel here. Yeah, reason is more than one distinct process. And I think I might've mentioned this earlier, but you know, in a, in a previous episode, but like rationality of means doesn't care what your ends are. If your ends are trying to annihilate the Jews, you can hire IBM to do cutting edge methods for how you're going to kill the Jews. <laughs> like things yeah. that I would include in reason are not considered there. Which is like the whole like uh, Frankfurt school point about fascism. Everyone's like, Oh, it's ir irrational and based on myth uh, themes and stuff. And while that's true, there's another sense that it's totally dependent on hyper, hyper instrumentalized rationality and why they invented most right. of our modern weapons. <laughs> So. It's the mythos of reason. It's how reason becomes ideology and, and you know can justify anything. This is this is what this is what most lay people know reasoning for as bottom up rationalizing. You know, this is where a lot of I think this is where a lot of just anti intellectual sentiment comes from. I would just like to read the brief definition that Eric Walton Wright gives uh, of these terms. Page 28, footnote 21. So the distinction between instrumental rationality, the rationality of adopting the best means for given ends, and value rationality or substantive rationality, the rationality of choosing actions that are consistent with value commitments. So the problem of labor performance as instances of technical inefficiencies between formal rationality and substantive rationality within capitalist relations. I don't exactly see what the specifics of that are. Like, I don't think Eric Wright really gets into it this chapter uh, so much. Obviously I can understand that, like I could, I, could, I could picture in my head like, oh yeah, I could see how those might exist in capitalism and it would be a, a fetter to production but I don't know what the specifics are that he's really talking about here. Well, the thing is, is in Weber, this actually emerges out of like discussions of Christian rationality and Christian civilization and the replacement of those values. Um, even the values of the Protestant work ethic with just the value of efficiency, qua efficiency itself, optimization, maximization. And one of the things that Frankfurt School throws at actually existing Marxism is that it doesn't get out of the problem of subsuming everything to instrumental rationality. And then in doing so actually ends up creating new class structures and this, that, and the other. Right. Not and violates its imperatives. Right. Like now, communism builds a class to destroy class and doesn't destroy class. Right. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, this gets even more extreme in like the Chinese example where you had like birth origins, caste systems that e people even criticized within China itself. 
and then were purged in the 60s. So it's one, I mean, I'm laughing because of the morbid terribleness of a lot of it. But Weber, Weber's predicting like a lot of these kinds of uh, presaging, maybe not predicting, not the right word, a lot of these kinds of arguments. But, but Kyle, it is vague. Like the, the substantive rationality being tied to given values is, is kind of, a, it's going back to the whole Aristotelian telos thing that yeah, rationality yeah. without telos pretty much is just efficiency. And then you can substitute emotively whatever the hell you want. Sure. Um, yeah. No, I, I'm just talking about the labor performance problem that uh, is, is being discussed here. That's the only thing that was like really unclear to me. Cause like, yeah, I mean, I've, I've read the Frankfurt school. Lot, well, I so. think in Weber, he yeah. thinks a lot of these opportunity catchers of bureaucracy and stuff actually are highly inefficient, parasitic, and drain all classes, not just even the poor ones. Like, so, so is this like opportunity capture as a form of rationalization of the economy gets in the way of economic aims? as like these are the goods we want out of production yes that's yeah. part of it okay so so it's like yeah like you know just for example uh like the bullshit jobs argument at like oh these are these are these are like things that make sense at the micro level in terms of managerial imperatives in a capitalist system but they produce an Irrash a value irrational outcome. Right. Yeah. And arguably even an economically even an economically inefficient outcome, even though each of them are instrumentally efficient in and of themselves. That's what they aim to be. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. So like what do we make of this idea then that he's not like not putting like the the point of production like and gen and exploitation as like a major feature of class relations. That's kind of whack. Well, as as uh, far as I understand, he was he was working off of marginalism. So production is is a vestigial aspect of marginalist economics that has no real place in it, uh, and that that kind of figures uh, then. Yeah, and there's another thing he's trying to do too. Is he doesn't actually believe in like modes of history, just like different life forms. And I, and I admit the modes of history and Marxism kind of get muddled because capitalism is the only thing that actually meets its the true mode form formality. I could go into that even in Marx proper, but Weber's trying to come up with a trans historical theory about how this is happening. Marx is, you know, saying, okay, we always produce stuff, but how we produce is radically different in different times and different places. And so you have to have a class analysis that is specific to this is why the forces that like the, the, the forces of history argument are, are you know, are, are the laws of motion argument. So important to Marxism is because like the class class struggle is the is the law of motion. But the actual substance of the classes in which motivate them is different for each society and each um, mode of production. And, and properly speaking, for Marx, capitalism is the only fully developed, consistent mode of production. I would go to bat for this way of looking at things. I think without a grand historical theory of, you know, surplus extraction and distribution, this is one of like the, I don't know, this is just one of the philosophical kind of things that grate on people about capitalism. Like I was talking to Sophia about being in a hospital where someone was very hungry and they didn't get food for like five hours, right? You're in a, you're in a healthcare institution and because of, you know, bureaucratic this and that, someone who is hungry in a healthcare institution doesn't get like some jello or some crackers. Like But on but unlike exploitation is not unique to capitalism though, as we like that's gonna be the difference. The the Weberian big story, which of course Weber doesn't have a big story, but he totally does, is that modernity changes everything. Modernity transforms all of these human you know, status and, I mean, there's a chart on the coming up. Ch changes all of these categories of, you know, what might be thought of as, you know, class or hierarchy into rationalized forms. So, I mean, class itself for Weber is just one of these rationalized forms of something that existed before. 
as far as an elaborated class notion from Weber goes, it doesn't really exist before capitalism, yeah. which I mean, Actually, in, as much as not that different from Marxism, it's not that different from Marxism. And even this concern with substantive rationality and formal rationality, I think we, it should be obvious where this plugs in, in Marxism in the forces and relations of production. You're trying to grow the productive forces, which can mean something more than just producing a million tons of steel or whatever. And, you know, you keep running into these situations where the way that property relations work and the laws that undergird that and the power structure around it, you know, actually get in the way of productivity, get in the way of things like resource efficiency, which would, which would, you know, just on some simple rational imperatives. And I don't think they're specifically capitalists, but whatever you would want these things to happen. But the way capitalist reason works ends up feeding back onto it and fucking it up. I was going to say to that, to that point, I don't know. I haven't seen the slide, so I don't know if this is a point that's going to come up later, but EO Wright includes a bit about Weber discussing the, what was it? The agrarian reforms of Elbian, something like that. East uh, Elbian. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, East Elbian labor reform or uh, agrarian reforms. And I can't read that without thinking Elbonian. Just <laughs> <sighs> the super Orientalist fake country in Dilbert who are uh -huh. to their armpits. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, who, who oppress left-handed people. Yeah. 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 It's a great comic. Everybody should read it. Absolutely. Oh um, God. If you ever seen <laughs> MRA Dilbert anyway. Yeah. Uh, but, but so there's um, a big Trump guy. Did the Dilbert guy come out? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah he Scott Adams is, is a right wing crank. Scott um, Adams thinks so, he has the power of hypnosis. Scott Adams is so reactionary that he thought MRAs were not anti feminist enough or basically a bunch of crybabies. Like men's rights activists who have sort of dropped off the radar that were, you know, a, a sort of thing for a while. He was like, these people are doing anti feminism wrong. Like, I mean, I agree with it that they were crybabies, but for completely different reasons than he did. Right. Oh. Uh, he also he also launched a burrito line based on Dilbert, a vegan burrito line, which apparently gave people like intestinal problems. So, in the mid nineties. Yeah, reading Scott Adams gives me intestinal problems, but that's a that's an entirely different story. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so anyway, what was I going to say? Your next uh, reactionaries move on. Yes. Um, <laughs> No, so okay, so so the the point of that was that the way that the way that Wright was describing how Weber was talking about these kinds of of relations qua rationality was that as as the agrarian reforms happened and the agrarian peasant was essentially proletarianized, like the the fundamental relations between peasant and landlord remained more or less fixed, but the expression of it changed through the introduction of market forces, right? And it was this, there's there's something that felt in the way that that was described kind of like transhistorical about the way that Weber is putting forth a an understanding of, of class relations and that it, it add to, I think it's your point, Derek, that it's it's the modernism and its rationality that becomes like the fundamental difference between the relations between various classes prior to the introduction of capitalism and afterwards. And it's, it's the introduction of the necessity of instrumental reason, which then becomes like the driving factor behind what are sort of like pre-existing class relations. And I'm kind of wondering if, if that's, if I'm I'm sort of like reading that right here in terms of what you were talking about. I think so. I mean, I think you mm -hmm. are. Well, the one thing I will say that get to what Tom was trying to get to, though, is that Weber's coming out of a left-wing tradition, and he would have seen himself as part of a left-wing tradition, that had abandoned LTV, uh, labor theory of value. It's one thing, Tom, that I, right. I, I think is quite interesting, that like, Yes, Hume had like a subjectivist theory of value, but the people who really came up with marginalism were socialists. They were yeah. not capitalists. 
and which is hilarious because capitalists see sees on to it because they're like, ah, ha, 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 you found a way that we can defeat Marx finally. I like, thought the like, marginalists came was... out of Burkean tradition. It came out of like who are you talking specifically? I thought like the Godfather was Jevons. I didn't think he was a socialist. He was. He was. He, but he he he. He was a socialist, but he was definitely not a Marxian socialist. Right. Like the, the socialism that this comes out of is kind of more like Saint Simonian influenced. It like, and 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 is has more of an ambiguous relationship to class than Marxism does. So yep. it's like a kind of like that's kind of like the like the British Fabian kind of tradition, is it? No, but no, more. It's more like. Socialism as okay, and I'm going to use this word, and all the Americans are going to misunderstand me forever. But socialism as corporatism, so mm -hmm. you, you achieve a class of society by all classes cooperating to the point there is no need for class anymore. And right, I right. believe and the introduction Jevons... of that society comes out of essentially like petty bourgeois paternalism. Yeah, yeah, Jevin specifically, I believe if i'm remembering correctly was very hostile to the working class he kind of wanted just like like how can we rationalize this system so these people are making such a fuss and causing so many problems can like find a place in the system and it's not going to be such a mess basically he was proto keynes because keynes yeah. also thought the same thing uh, uh, but that's, yes that's... they were they were nonetheless socialists and that is important to to remember it's just they they were not marxists but the austrians seize on to this to be like ha ha we can defeat you now marxists your socialist your socialist allies have have given us the weapon to destroy you i mean, well, I mean and that's i know that sounds he-man villainish but that's kind of what actually happened reactionaries do this all the time ah, nice nice i guess nice instrumental reason we'll use it for different substantive ends yep <laughs> Same as it ever was, the, the, the socialists are our enemy. Uh, but yeah, I just, I just want to emphasize that point that production is not really a metaphor that makes any sense in a uh, Walrasian... Yeah, sorry, I was thinking about Walra, not Jevons, when I, was, I made that comment about working class. But uh, oh, in a well, Walrasian well, framework, okay. it, it's not something that really makes any sense. Uh, and it's only included in the theory because it's such an appealing metaphor for how economic life works that you can't really get rid of it and have people buy into your theory. But there, it's it's not something that makes any theoretical sense because you're just talking about distribution of stuff in a field. You're not talking about production and its circulation. Yeah, this is very similar to MMT's whole, like, we're going to tax the rich because we need to keep them less powerful, but not because we have any economic incentive to do so. <laughs> yes, these ideas don't go away. They reformulate. Yeah, Weber just inherits all this. And I, I would also say I, I definitely subscribe to the the line of uh, thinking that otherwise, I think Weber's project is largely framed by what Marx wrote. Like, even yeah. the Protestant ethic argument i believe the skeleton of it is actually in capital volume one there's so much in weber that seems to be either an extension or a response to marx economic and theory aside this is exactly what you'd expect because he's a revisionist s payday guy right so there's a you know there's a there's a wave of marxists that are revising the sociology of marx in a way that does away with the need for political revolution with the understanding that they're still in favor of some sort of economic revolution. And if even eventually that becomes market socialism and, you know, we could debate all day whether that counts, but ultimately it becomes reformism and then it becomes not even that. <laughs> right. Yeah. This is a, a well-known, well-worn cycle and Weber for this reason becomes the source material for creating, you know, an alternative to Marxist theories of class. And I think it's widely successful because it taps into the things that I'm going to call post-material so-called economies, you know, economies that are based more on service labor and circulations of things 
produced elsewhere or, you know, intangible forms of production, you know, digitalization and that sort of thing. Service it's, work. Yeah. Like that sort of stuff is better addressed in a way by the Weberian framework. And it's developed as an alternative to Marx and, you know, an attempt to undermine Marxist class analysis. But Weber has all that in the background. And, and I think you know, right, it's very convincing on this score that it's not theoretically incompatible at all. Yeah, it's, it's more, it's emphasis, a lot of it. It's just emphasis. But like, you know, that emphasis makes a huge amount of difference because you can actually read, does. you can read shit like that in like Keynes or stuff like that, you know, if you want to find it. Well, yeah, I mean, I think like if you, like by the time you get to Keynesianism, you got like, you got a, a moribund capitalist class who's reaching out to various populist and socialist ideas to revitalize itself. And Weber's really convenient for that. I mean, this is also, you know, studying the American left. You see this in the American left all the time. FDR steals a bunch of ideas from populist and socialist and actually fascist and accidentally creates something like proto-Keynesianism, but he's doing it ad hoc to kind of steal the momentum from these counter movements. Because at the time, as opposed to the 50s opposing these these ideas, you're, you actually revitalize your own dead-ass ideas by... Um, stealing them selectively and undermining them partially. Okay, let's move it on. We've done uh, two slides, 45 minutes. We're making good progress. We are making good progress. Now the we've got a The moment table. I said Foucault, I knew we were in trouble. That's it. Well, nobody said dialectics, so we couldn't move on. Good That's point. what I was waiting for. I thought, Overdetermination. I thought I yeah, there we go. Esri, you were talking about this table only a minute ago. Do you want to take us through it? This is a lovely table. I think uh, the one that I'm thinking of is is further on, but this one is this is what a table this is. Big fan of this table. So oh, table we have coon. yeah, table coon. the Japanese honorific. Seriously, uh, like I, I feel Derek. Do you feel old? Like with all this anime shit? Like I have no idea what's going on. I'll tell you. Like I read anime in about 1984. <laughs> I read Akira. <laughs> Before you were fucking born, a lot of you. But I've never read anything since, and I've no idea what the fuck is going on. All these people on the Discord server, all this, like literally twenty five percent. If it's not Puya talking about his god AI, it's fucking random anime shit. <laughs> well, I know you don't know what the hell you're talking about because you said you read anime, you read manga, you watch anime, manga. Fucking there you go. Bomb. There you go. Fucking right. <laughs> fucking right. I don't get it. I really. I was. I was just old enough to be around when Legend of the Overfiend was a thing, so I know just enough to follow these conversations. But I have no. If all these titles and stuff these youngsters mention, I don't know. Fucking millennial you... Zoomer cucks. I don't know. Somebody, yeah. somebody <laughs> listening to this though is go is going to get the Table Coon reference, and they're going to be laughing their ass <laughs> off. And I, I made that for them. No, I, I just... Tenderous, you've woke me to that. Honestly, I do know what you mean. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I just got called Kaidukun like on a daily basis in Japan because that was the proper suffix to use to my name. So it's, it's not, not alien to me in any what does way. It mean? It's like, it's just a word you use to refer like it's a respectful word to use to a younger mask person in Japan. Younger yeah. mask person. Masculine. Yeah, like masculine. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. I was thinking. Ah, uh, wow. okay. Well, yeah. Because yeah. in Korea, yeah. in Korea, they just don't have a respectful word for younger people because you wouldn't need <laughs> it's Damn. It's actually the, the, the Chinese character it's derived from is the character that refers to something analogous to gentleman. Ah. So, it's, it's not a, it's not a, uh, like, diminutive term really it's more like just just a nice a nice thing to say to younger mask people if you don't know their their profession uh profession wouldn't uh wouldn't okay. really come into because it because korea yeah. all those like all those like, like if, if if you if, if yeah like if it was a if it was like a, a teacher thing then you would still say sensei but it's it's like someone you would use for someone who is equal to you in rank or lower to you in rank. 
Okay, so that, that's anyways. a nice bridge back here, isn't it? So spheres of social interaction. This they, this is the categories of the table: sphere of social interaction, category that locates individuals within a distribution of power, and then attributes intrinsic to categories of the distribution of power. So this isn't going to translate real well on a podcast, but basically, you have like for instance the economic sphere of social interaction. The category that locates individuals within the distribution of power is class. It has objective properties, but here in the table, it doesn't have subjective identity and it doesn't have collective action as, it, as an intrinsic property. Mm -hmm. um, in the communal sphere of social interaction, you have a status group as a category that locates you in the division of power, which has objective properties, has subjective identity, but doesn't intrinsically have collective action. And then in the political sphere of social interaction, the party locates you within the distribution of power, has objective property, subjective identity, and collective action as an intrinsic attribute. So see, in Marx, this is very actually somewhat similar if you look at the class for itself and the class and itself distinction. Yeah. Which he brings um, up. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Give me an example here then for people listening for this the status group. So we have like our class is just like you know, you're you are say a worker versus a capitalist or something. Y mm. Your party, you are in a worker's party, but what right. is a say a status group that doesn't have collective action? Give an example of that. Your, your racial group, your the, and the thing is, it's not that it can't have collective action, but collective action is not intrinsic to it. So right, you like, can be black and not participate in black collective action. I think like blue collar is, is analogous as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or an, an Ivy League, an Ivy League student, or something, okay. or you're part of the Ivy Leagues. So anything, it, it can Pretty be anything. Much all your intersectional identity categories actually belong in this in the communal status group thing for Weber, which is actually interesting because we can think of Weber being used, you know, um, with stratification theory to like block out Marx. But you have to you have to also block out a hell of a lot of Aber to use it the way we would use it. Yeah, but status group would cut would cover those big intersectional identities, right? Because subjective identity is an intrinsic part of that. But, but also and, cover like religion. It would also cover well, you know, right? But it would but it would also cover things that are like a little more like tangential to these more sort of foundational you know identities. I'm using term identities, but we're really talking about something, you know, maybe a little deeper than that, that intrinsically has identity as part of it. But, but then it also, you know, it also just breaks down to very, I mean, like high school cliques or something like, <laughs> like this, this is a very, like, were you a concept. drama kid? <laughs> this is an extremely flexible concept that rhymes a lot with people's experience. This is why I think this, framework is really valuable because it doesn't just happen to my preferred world of abstract underlying mechanisms, but it resonates with, you know, the, how people experience different forms of discrimination or what have you in a way that is relational. It's not purely individualizing. This is a big step forward in interpreting the world as we know it like i don't think this should be dismissed as an anti-marxist way of looking at things yeah i think it's i think it's just another way of saying a similar thing the um so just just to clear up here like is, is anybody on the panel was anybody on the panel a drama kid can we just clear that up derek you were actual drama kid what does that mm -hmm. mean like does that mean like you did plays in school i was not an actor i was a crew member um, I was actually, I was surprising to no one that knows me and knows drama. I was a stage manager. <laughs> so uh, I was yeah. basically a professional bully. So <laughs> that's not really we needed you. you. Utilizing your best qualities, Derek. And Tiberius, yeah, so what were you doing? We, we used to have interclick wars with, uh, with the theater tech kids. Theater tech kids, fuck's sake. Right. Okay. You were a goddamn on. actor? Hell yes, I was. Scum. Of, of, of course, <laughs> of course <laughs> Tiberius was. I mean, really. And so the communal sphere of interaction and status groups within it can go down like fairly, you know, to Deep. fairly micro identities and 
This is yeah, a we're, lot of we're talking about cultural like... headbutting. This is this is actually a split within a within a you know subcultural. I mean, micro fucking subcultural like after school activity. I that mean, we're between, still talking between about. the theater kids and the the theater tech kids, like there was maybe twenty six or twenty seven of us in total. So <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's interesting, actually, though, to think about the political action sphere and the communal action sphere, because this, I think, is where things are more muddled now. If you ask yourself what defines the commu- the political action sphere other than the most vague sense of party, and the only thing that separates it from a communal action sphere is whether or not it can act as collective action. So this is actually gets to something interesting we talk about in Marxism all the time. All sectarian groups are not political by this yes. schema. Yeah, they're, they're not communal. political. They're communal because they do not have in the inherent size to take meaningful collective action relative to everything else. I think it's even more than just size. I don't think they even have the goddamn intent. <laughs> well, yeah, there, <laughs> there, there, there's that too. But <laughs> the, the no. thing I actually find most questionable about this typology is that political parties intrinsically have collective action. <laughs> Yeah, like I know what they mean because you know, you, you in theory the Democrats could get everyone to you know have them vote to raise the minimum wage, but that's not actually what they're going to do. Well, yeah, it, but are they an actual party? It's a it's a certain kind of view of modern political rationality that I think sort of like suffers from the horizon of the time in which it was created. And like, is maybe not that exhaustive in its description of what political parties do. Right. Uh, it, it, it's like it's very much like this idea of, uh, oh, you have the the SPD day, and that's the Workers Party, and it collectively represents the workers' interests in a real actionable way versus the bourgeois party, which is opposed to them. And that there's a kind of logic and reason to that, which is somewhat alien to the sort of like mealy mouthed, waffling, directionless view of party politics that is much more common today. And well, frankly, it's much more common throughout history, to be honest. Like, yeah, yeah, fair, fair. Mass politics is actually like, like mass politics exception. in the way we saw them. It's actually an exception. Yeah, it, like, yeah. So it's interesting that, like, I mean, and yes, there is a sense in which law, by like law enacted, is collect is a as a, a collective action. But then that means the um, category that locates individuals in the distribution of power is not the party; it is the legal apparatus. And I don't know. If that's true, then like a whole lot of assumptions about like the way politics works gets dashed by this. And I also want to point out that like in the American system, we've had mass politics, but it's never actually overlapped with our binary party system, like ever concretely. Like, ever. I'm gonna I'm gonna say something controversial here. Like, is that kind of actual mass politics? To me, it seems like it's it's something that is only true in pre-revolutionary to revolutionary times and post-war times. What do people think about that? I, I hmm. think the, the civil rights movement was actual mass politics. Yeah, I, I can't block no, that. That was pre-revolutionary, movement. I think. It just, the revolution just got crushed before it even happened. Like If I think about Irish history, it's like politics was alive and trashing like just try, prior to the War of Independence and it quickly metastasized into like kind of you know forms there afterwards and it's been really essentially stuck in that formation for a hundred years it's kind of it's fraying now with Sinn Féin but like if you look up up north in Northern Ireland the political powers out there have literally come out of war if you look to like well in American politics the parties come from like what are the origins of their parties like the 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 current two parties come from the civil war you know what I mean yeah prior to that they one is the party of the yeoman proto bourgeois and the other didn't exist yet. So <laughs> uh, I guess you could see the Whigs as the analogous to the Republicans, but like the Whigs were not actually even a party. Look at German politics today. You still have the fucking the, sh- the carcass of the SPD, you know, still hanging around a hundred years after 
it's you know actually lively period. Hell, you have oh, yeah. the Cargus of Delinka, which is like. <laughs> What mm-hmm. is Delinka from? Delinka is. It's from the, the from the the Eastern it's, Bloc. Yeah, okay, it's from okay, the, yeah, the, yeah. the 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 Communist Party in Eastern Germany. Yeah, it's sort of a uh, combining with some elements of the extra parliamentary sort of left on in West Germany. Yeah, I guess the thing I would say is that broadly speaking, there is a sort of democratic Republican Party, so called, that lasts. Like it's it's a bit of projecting onto the past. But that is one of the oldest, like, political institutions there is. The mo- what is, you know, the more or less the predecessor to the modern day Democratic Party. Yes, yeah, it's, um, it's the oldest member-based political party on the planet. Right. What about the Tory party? The Tory party. The Tory party is not formally, it's, it's informally older, but it's not formally older. And there's a lot of controversy about all this. It's actually, I went through a pop the left where I spelled out the different theories of political parties. And the other thing was that the Tory party was a party amongst parliamentarians only. It wasn't a party with it where, where voters identified with it. The SPD is pretty much the prototypical like mass party. Yeah, it um, is. It is considered the oldest mass party by most people. And weren't there like two separate Tory parties before they became like a proper party? There was the was it the Whigs? In English history, was it not the Whigs and the Tories? And then it became the Tories and the Liberals? Right. The Whigs the Whigs became the Liberals, unlike in America, where the Whigs became the Republicans. Although, to be fair, the Republicans in, in early American history were the Liberals. So the Democrats have managed to survive by not believing in anything ever. Yeah. That's actually your best strategy as a political entity <laughs> to survive over the ages is to have literally yeah. no core. Yeah, pure instrumental threat. reason. Yeah. yeah, no, this is exactly right. That whatever you think you're about, who cares? Let's just keep this beast rolling. Yeah, they're doing a good job for now. So this is quite party oriented. Like, like where does like anarchism and some of the ultra left stuff sit on to the top of this? Uh, for communal, Weber, they don't matter. <laughs> I would say communal and economic. Do they intrinsically have uh, collective action? No, but they can. Right, it's not an intrinsic dimension of the category, but if it did gain a collective action capacity, that's well, that's the, pretty the, This is another place where it gets weird because, like, if churches, for example, take collective action, they're they're a communal status group. Weber would not make them a political group; they would remain a communal status group. Whereas, if anarchists be, it became like a collective actor, they would become a political like that. That's actually an unclear mechanism in Weber. But this is this ties exactly into debates around is anarchist organizing meaningfully different than political organizing? Because once they start developing collective action potentials, they do end up either paralleling party structures or formally kind of announcing them. This, th- so, like, the union becomes the party, is it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So, something like that. And I think that this points to a real, I don't know, I don't think this is just a quirk of the typology. It points to a real kind of paradox and, you know, two intuitions cl- clashing that, you know, you, you deal with when you're trying to do something like politics against politics or whatever. So this, this, be, this yeah. is like, if we got really, t- I'm going to make an analogy to science for nerds. This is like how a species is like supposed to have a defined criterion, but it really doesn't. And sometimes some species are really subspecies are maybe they're not species at all because they can interbreed, although they're not supposed to, but then they can. So all these taxonomies are inherently on liminal cases, more fluid than, you know, and I honestly think even in Marx, that's true, even though I think it's a little bit more objective. Um, It's true about taxonomies, like the real world doesn't, What's the objective the property of status groups, though? Like, <laughs> I'm actually thinking about that. Like, like that they exist at all? Like, because, okay, class, class, if you break down status groups under modern sociology, you have the difference between identification and classification. So what you see yourself as and what you are categorized as or classified as. Class being short for classification, right? 
but also that's like that's specifically economic whereas for example Ezri and I are both of some mild Hebrew descent. Ezri's got a lot more than me. My identification with with probably Hebrew origins is actually probably stronger than Ezri's. But my um, classification, even by other Jews, would be weaker to non-existent because my heritage claims are by you know by blood rider much thinner. So are you are you Derek saying then that you're a weak ass Jew? Is that what you're saying? Yes, I'm. I am a weak ass Jew. Only but, by blood. But but yeah, but 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 if I took that the, the socially relevant categorization and made it Germans, my ass is thrown in the camp too, because it's... I, for sure. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I, this is going to feel a little strange, but I think that social property is the objective property being talked about. Okay, it's not necessarily a material property. Well, and and to that point, my brother and I have a have a long long running joke that uh, we're both white until we show the cop our ID cards because oh, yeah. our dad is from Punjab, and so we have Punjabi names. And so as soon as as soon as the cop sees non white name, you know, or or as soon as some well meaning liberal goes, oh, but no, where are you actually from? Like that's that's when you stop being white. Yeah. Look, let, let me just say, Derek, if I was in if I was in Germany at the wrong time with my red hair and curls, I would have been fucking in. They would have just chucked me in the in the fucking camps. To yeah, me, just, just yeah. to be sure. You would have gotten chucked in the camps because you can't keep your fucking mouth shut. As I was to say, true. you're a shut communist your and, you're you. Irish, <laughs> and you're Irish and you're Irish and you're Irish. You're Irish, <laughs> yeah. The, 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 the reason <laughs> that you would have been thrown into the camps, knowing what I know about you, Tom, is that your wife is black. Oh, yeah, that's another yeah, that that that'll Probably. also do it. Yeah, that um, yeah. she's not my wife though. We're living in sin. Let's get that. Straight. My bad. Oh, yeah. you would have been thrown in the camps for that too. So you got it five times. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> the you can't touch my record. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you think... got Roma. Oh, you got everything. You got the, yeah. You, got you, the... you, you, you get all. You get all the symbols on the uniform. Fuck yeah, it. it's yeah. like merit badges. <laughs> Seriously, you'd be like a NASCAR driver. Fucking hell. Hell yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, I, I'd be able to get into the party until the night of long knives when they would summarily right. execute me for not being fascist enough. Yeah. Tiberius. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. Music